thank you for joining us today for the first of three webinars um, focused on um, mid-career faculty. And so this series is focused on the academic career trajectory. And so we are picking up from where we left off with pre-tenure with this post-tenure series. Um, so I, we are very happy to have you today. My name is Jessica Tost at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm hosting this series with Emily Solari from the University of Virginia. And this first webinar is titled, Now What? Um, so diving into what happens after you get tenure. Um, the series is hosted by the Division for Research. Um, if you'd like to support this continued programming, we're always happy and open to getting donations by PayPal to support DR and the work that DR does. And if you are not yet a member of DR, you can always join CC and join DR along with your CC membership. So the, this is, as I said, the first of three webinars. The second webinar will be next Friday focused on the research agenda. And then the webinar, the next one will be the week after that focused on the road to full. And in that third one, we will have some senior administration and deans of colleges of education talk about what does promotion to full look like and what are the expectations. Throughout, you're welcome to put questions in the chat and we will be happy to address them as we go. And hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes at the end to, to talk about questions as well. I'll hand it over to introduce our special guests. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Solari. Um, we are very lucky to have two guests here today to talk us through the now what part of once you are promoted to associate professor. Um, for our first one is Nicole Patton Terry who has, who has holds many different positions and many different hats, and she has a lot of titles. So she is uh, relatively newly the director of the Florida Center for Reading Research. She is a professor in the School of Teacher Education at FSU, and she's the deputy director of the REL Lab at South Southeast. Um, and also just someone who personally has provided a lot of advice to me over the last few years. So I'm really excited to have her here to sort of share all of her wonderfulness with the group. And our second special guest is Nathan Clemens, which I think is funny because I call him Nate because I've known him since um, he was a graduate student at Lehigh University where I was a postdoc. We overlapped at Lehigh together and Ed Shapiro used to call him Nate all the time. So I call him Nate Clemens. Um, he's an associate professor in the Department of Special Education at UT Austin and also in the Meadow Center for Preventing Educational Risk. So, we decided to have this additional webinar series focused on mid-career faculty because, as you may have already noticed, that most of the work and the webinars and the resources and supports that exist are for pre-tenure faculty. So when you look up, this is just if you do a quick Google search for comics or graphics around academia or faculty, or, this is what comes up. It's all about the tenure track. It's all about getting tenure and what that looks like. And a lot of the, the resources that we create are around helping faculty understand the expectations and requirements to get to tenure. But you successfully get tenure. So you're here because that happened already or it's gonna be happening soon. You celebrate, you get yourself something nice and then you sort of think, okay, now what do I do next? What do I do to plan for the next X many years in my career. The other thing that I think is really interesting here is I sort of track this a bit over my career is a lot of the surveys of associate professors really show that this is the most unhappy group of people or the dis, most dissatisfied group of people if you, um, along sort of the academic trajectory. And I find that fascinating. And I think maybe some of it may be because there is sort of a high of getting tenure, right? And then you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do next? What's the next thing that I'm supposed to be doing to get to that next step of full professor? And so that's one, another reason why I think it's really important to have these conversations with associate professors. Um, so, and there's some reasons why. I mean, it's an unclear time frame for a lot of people. When you step into an assistant professor role, it's pretty clear how many years you have till you get tenure. Um, you, there's just up and out policies for a lot of institutions. So the goal is really, really clear. You have six or seven years or have five years, however long it is, 
at your particular institution. So there's some lack of clarity about what you're supposed to be doing, how long it takes. And I think a lot of that depends on each institution as well. Um, and there's a lack of dedicated um, support and resources. So we were hoping that bringing folks together um, would be a good way to maybe develop some sort of community around this. And so maybe some groups that people can sort of um, come together to talk about um, their experiences and how they're getting to full. So the goal, the overarching goal of this series is to de demystify this process and talk openly about mid your mid-career path. So we're hoping we can do that with all of you. So we're organized around three broad things. We're talking about the associate's life. So what does it mean to be an associate professor? How might stuff change in your life? Um, some things I think are really common that we're gonna sort of go deeper into is uh, sort of this extra potential new burden of service in your life. A lot of assistant professors are protected, quote unquote, protected from service. And how do you sort of balance what appears to be sort of a new demand, right? So you have your research that you still have to keep going, but also there's more service and some other things going on, both within your institution and perhaps nationally, internationally. Um, looking ahead to full, so how do you sort of, what are your targets? And really just broad mid-career advice and also talk around um, questions of, um, balancing pro professional and personal life and what this means. And then also um, we are in the context of COVID. So we're hoping to have some conversations about what this means for trajectory, trajectory and research agendas and stuff like that. So we're going, we decided to frame these webinars kind of as asking questions and then seeking answers. We're doing this in a couple of ways. We have asked a number of DR members to submit video recorded responses. So we have a couple of short videos we'll share with folks answering these questions. And then we have our panelists who are gonna talk about some other questions and provide advice and be here live to answer questions. So the first video we have, we asked folks to record a brief response to the question, what surprised you most about life post-tenure? I remember feeling like I wasn't standing on the edge of a cliff anymore. Like now I knew I could do all the things that were expected of me so I could relax a little and enjoy it more uh, and do it with confidence. I think often folks describe the idyllic, idyllic, idyllic uh, post tenure state of getting to relax, take a break. Um, I found it very challenging to do so and, and for good reasons. Um, I have found that post tenure I, there has been this ever expanding process of, I, of finding new colleagues, new potential connections with new lines of work. I have felt that my world is getting bigger and bigger. And so because of that, any of my efforts to try to slow things down or, or cull a little bit, um, my, my projects has been slowed by what has been this world building. Again, nothing really surprised me. Um... I, I always had thought before I got tenure that I would, you know, some of the service demands would pick up. And I think that definitely happened. Um, but it, it wasn't anything too unbearable. And the service that I did get kind of thrown into um, was stuff that I actually enjoyed, like being the head of a search committee and that, that kind of thing. So, so I liked that. Um, I, I don't think there was anything else that really surprised me. I suppose I was most surprised that post-tenure life wasn't more relaxed than pre-tenure life. Um, I was told years ago by an advisor that whatever my doctoral student life was like was likely to be what my faculty life was like. And I didn't believe that. Of course, it was true. You sort of set a, um, a habit of how you work and the pace at which you work and the um, I guess the momentum you carry into your work and that doesn't change. And I would say the same is true um, post-tenure. You, you begin to develop a sense of um, what you want to accomplish in your pre-tenure life, setting goals, achieving those goals, 
um, facing rejection, redoing things, and none of that changes. Um, that was a surprise to me. Um, I think that I had been, you know, maybe spending a little bit too much time at the office. Um, my receiving tenure corresponded also with um, me having, uh, we had a son at the same time. So I think I started devoting a little more time to family, um, started realizing that, you know, the things that I had left on my list would be there the next day, that I didn't have to stay at the office till late at night to get those things done and check them off. So um, I was happily surprised that I had a little more balance in my life. Just before tenure, and certainly after tenure, there were more requests outside of the university for service, things like reviewing papers, editing journals, reviewing grants, serving on professional boards. And I had been prepared for my university service to increase. A lot of people talked about that um, and that you wouldn't be as protected in that area. But I really um, was, I was really surprised by the amount of outside the university service that increased. I think I thought that would be about the same or that it would gradually increase. Um, so I really had to um, find ways to determine what things I could take on with my time in terms of that outside of the university service. Okay, so I think we want to now turn this over to our guests. So with the question of what changed the most for you post tenure and also encourage folks if there are questions to please put them in the chat because we are monitoring that. Um, Nicole, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm trying to think of something that is different than what others have said because it, all of that is true. Every single thing everyone said is 100% is true. I do, I, if I could add anything, I think you also start to, once you, there is a, or at least for me, there is a decision you have to make about what you want to do next in terms of going towards full or maybe not going towards full, maybe moving it into administrative roles. Um, but there's a, a piece of this that you start to think about that really is a bit like legacy building. It's like, what do, what do I want to leave behind? Those thoughts start to creep in in ways that they didn't before. And just much in the same way that you decide you're going to go for tenure and you have to do things to get tenure, you have to decide at some point which one of these trajectories you're gonna go on and start doing things, making decisions to, to get you towards whatever that path is. And that can feel somewhat overwhelming because it's not, as someone else said, it's not clearly in a box anymore. It's not, oh yeah, I'm gonna do these things. I'm gonna publish or do this or that to get tenure. But it's, if I am interested in being a dean, what do you do for that? If I am interested in being a department chair, what do you do for that? If I'm interested in starting my own nonprofit, what do you do for that? So those options started to open up in a way that can feel very overwhelming. Nate, oh, I was looking for you. Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, not too much. I mean, I, I think in terms of what changed, um, I think like Nicole said, it, it's sort of changes in mindset a little bit. You start thinking much longer term. You're not thinking about survival as much anymore. Um, uh, and you're thinking a little bit more broader in terms of where things are going. <clears throat> um, I think, you know, like some of the videos mentioned that, um, you know, they, anxiety perhaps is decreased a bit. Um, there's a little less anxiety. You're not as focused on just, you know, how many numbers you have every year in terms of publication. Um, but I don't want to say that that is completely removed. You know, I think um, a lot of that is healthy um, to have at least expectations for yourself in terms of progress and momentum. So um, I guess the change changes prior to mostly thinking more longer term, larger scale in terms of work. Do you want to ask this one, Emily, or do you want me to? Yeah, talk? sure. So I actually had a follow-up question, but I'll stick towards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so what, to what degree did you pivot post-tenure? So examples of your research change or your overall priorities? And the other thing that my question was also collaboration, because I found as I moved 
past tenure that I had new collaboration. So if you have any thoughts on that, Nate, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, I think um, not many major changes. I think what I've tried to do is try to be more focused in, in what I'm doing in terms of my work. I've, I don't think I've ever been very successful at that, um, having a very cohesive research program, but that's where I've tried to make efforts toward. Um, I think also building, moving towards uh, more collaborations, I think is something too I've tried to, to do as well. Um, but in terms of, of, of significant pivots, I wouldn't say significant, more minor shifts. Now for me, and I think this um, also has to do with that decision, whatever, or the, I shouldn't say it like it's on, like on Tuesday, you're going to just decide. <laughs> but um, you do start, when you start thinking much more long term, you, there is a sort of a value setting that happens here. Um, and when you get to, when you, once you achieve tenure, there is a certain amount of power you suddenly have that you didn't have before to direct your attention. Um, and so that for me was a, a it was a catalyst for a pivot. And so I did pivot, not just in the research I do, but in how, in how I do it formally. So I started a research center in, the, in our college of that. Um, that took me into doing much more administrative related things. Um, I, thinking much more strategically and politically outside of my research and thinking much more about my the university and the community in which I was working in. Um, thinking much more about what that meant in terms of how I engage with students and how I engage with other colleagues, how I engage as a researcher, how I continue to do research or not do research. Um, so there was a there was a pivot for me in that moment. But that was also because I was starting to, I was starting to determine that the my long-term vision for the work that I do I wanted it to have an impact that was outside of my university and outside of um, traditionally how things are counted in our discipline in terms of the, what our work counts for where you know I want people the work that I do to not be stuck in journals and I don't want it to be stuck in conferences and I don't want it to be stuck just amongst us I want other I want it to be used in that school around the corner and that meant working in a different way for me. Um, so it did, and then as a result, it did mean a pivot in, in how I did my research and how I did my work in taking on different um, administrative roles in a way that I, that I wasn't before. But I also, and I remember intentionally thinking about this, that meant for me, my goal at that time wasn't necessarily making full. It was exercising this power. If I was going to move towards being full and I wanted to do that, let's say in five years, the next five years, that is probably not a pivot I, I would have taken, right? So I, so there's a part of this that's a, that I think that's why I'm saying you have to decide. I decided that I wasn't trying necessarily to do that. I was trying to do something different and I was okay with that. Yeah, I think that's an important point. I think part of this is also, you kind of have more of a freedom to make that decision for yourself. I think also when you're mm -hmm. trying to get promoted with tenure, you're, you're supposed to be able to show that you have your own independent line of research, right? And that's sort of like the thing. And you are the scholar in this area. And I, and I think when you get from associate to full, you actually have more freedom to like do collaborations and sort of larger scale work potentially, because it doesn't just have to be about your own research agenda. And I think that can be a bit freeing for people um, if they want it to be. So. I think it is a, a part of this that is about, a, it's that choice that you just said. And that, in my opinion, not just for me, but in others, I think as well, who have hit this point, because um, it happens again when you get the full, that ability to have a choice is terrifying. Right, because what if you make the wrong one? Right, <laughs> right, right. Now the choice is get a certain number of publications every year, go get a grant, make sure you go to these conferences, make sure you teach well, and that your students like you. Like the, the decisions are made for you, but when you hit the point where you get to make the choice, for some folks that is terrifying because you don't want to choose wrongly, you know. And but for other folks, it can feel very freeing. 
because yeah, yeah, I can do what I want to do and choose what I want to do. And I just, I've never had that feeling to this day. I still don't, even as a full professor, I don't really feel like I can do what I want to do. I don't, I don't, that to me, that notion is odd to me. So the next question we asked our DR members to respond to by video was what was one thing you wish you approached differently after receiving tenure? And we're actually going to get our panel members to talk on this kind of a, a little later. Um, but we have a, a couple of other responses first. So I think um, one of the things that maybe won't be surprising is that the level of pressure uh, reduces a little bit after 10 years so that you can actually um, not stop working, but you can really focus on the things that you want to do to increase your scholarship. Um, you don't have to worry so much about sort of the individual number crunching, like do I have this many pubs and this type of journal? you can kind of focus a little bit more on some pieces that you just remain really interested in. So um, scholarship has to continue, but it gets a little more flexible, I guess. Well, I took stock of what I had done so far and started to retool a bit. I started to question whether all the research and publishing I had done during my pre-tenure years was really making a difference. I talked to my mentor about this and realized that one way to make more of a difference was through teacher education and professional development. So I started to devote my attention to these areas across my research, teaching, and service. In research by directing my grant writing toward teacher professional development, in teaching uh, by developing a seminar in teacher education research so that I could learn more about this topic alongside my students. And by the way, that's a great way to learn something new is to teach a seminar on it if you're able to. And then also in service by working with my colleagues to redesign our special education program. Um, I wish I had a much more exciting answer, but I don't think I really approached anything much differently. Um, I just kind of continued on a trajectory that I was already on. Um, I was fortunate that in 2015, I um, was a, became the PI of an IES Development and Innovation Grant. Um, and in 2016, I was a co-PI. I started that project. It was a um, model demonstration grant funded by um, OSEP. And so I got tenured in 2017. So nothing much changed in 2017, 2018. Um, I continued to work on those, those research projects um, and I, I did start to, to conceptualize some of the next um, projects that, or next proposals that, that I, with my team, would, would go for. Um, so, you know, I, I felt like I had some time to work on that, but I don't think anything was different just because I had tenure. Well, I found that I had to say no a lot more. I had to really focus on what I wanted to accomplish and do for the field and for students with disabilities and really think about which things that could align, aligned with those goals um, because I couldn't do everything, um, all the opportunities that were available and coming my way. I would say I um, didn't feel quite so rushed or, um, concerned about how my research interests might be measured by others. So I stepped back and um, really focused on, really thought about what I wanted to focus on, what kind of an impact I wanted to have um, with my research and scholarship and decided that um, I really wanted to focus on teacher preparation, um, which ironically, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that today. So. Um, but that was a big, I think that was a big mindset shift for me after receiving tenure. I think one thing that I approached differently was, I, I think I started caring less about what the thread was going to be across my research. Um, I tend to be somebody that focuses on a few different areas, including measurement and assessment, as well as issues related to teacher quality and, and more generally outside of special education teacher time use. Um, and I spent a lot of time trying to create a narrative around those things. And I think post tenure, I've, I've relaxed my standards for how I define and describe collectively my work. Um, number two, 
What surprised you most about life post tenure life? <laughs> I think often folks describe the idyllic, idyllic, idyllic uh, post tenure state of getting to relax, take a break. Um, I found it very challenging to do so, and and for good reasons. Um, I have found I that so. post tenure. I, there has been this ever expanding process of, uh, of finding new colleagues, new potential connections with new lines of work. I have felt that my world is getting bigger and bigger. And so because of that, any of my efforts to try to slow things down or, or cull a little bit, um, my, my projects has been slowed by what has been this world building. Yes, that was my fault. We listened to part of Nate's answer twice, but that's okay. But good advice. <laughs> um, so how do you look ahead and plan for future promotion? So um, how do you think through your road to full? So I'm gonna start with Nicole there. Um, so again, I think, uh, my road to full might have been a little different than others um, maybe travel um, because I, my road to full came through a lot of this sort of uh, this decision to move in this sort of administrative research director center kind of navigation. Um, but uh, I will say that when I thought about it, I think you have to, um, what, it's so going to getting tenure, you start thinking about being the card carrying member of your field, right? That's the way I always thought about it. Getting tenure means that anybody in our field would say, yep, you've got the membership card. Getting to full is much more about um, beyond your field and beyond our world, it, it, uh, seeing you as bigger than that, right? Seeing you as bigger than just belonging to your discipline. You belong to academia. So for me, it is much more about thinking about what you're doing with your students and how you're pushing students forward because your students, they're like your children. They become, they become a part of the recognition that you are leading in this field. Um, what you're doing in terms of contributions, in terms of uh, journals or, or professional societies in, in leading the charge, setting the vision for, for those groups and how they push us forward becomes a bigger part of it. Um, even in terms of uh, your grant activity or what, what research work that you're doing, you're, you're doing much riskier, much more high profile things that if it works, right, if, it, if we pull this off, it pushes us all forward. To me, that's, that's, the, that's the notch up that comes with full that no one ever writes down anymore, but it's, it's no longer necessarily about the quantity as much, it's much more about the quality and how that quality takes, that transcends us and transcends our field. That's the way I always thought about the role of the pool. Nate, did you have anything? Yeah, I think, and I'm sort of in this right now and thinking about going up perhaps in the next two years or so, but um, I, I think getting feedback a lot, you know, maintaining uh, mentorship, maintaining mentors for yourself, you know, that's a big part of, in many cases, being an assistant faculty. But I think, um, you know, what's been helpful for me is maintaining that too. So having senior faculty at serving as mentors to give you guidance on, you know, does it, you know, what, what kind of timeline should you be on and what should you be thinking about for, for going up the full? Um, it is much more nebulous. You know, there's no timeline, as other people have said. Um, and, and the factors you're thinking about aren't as quantifiable in many cases as as they are when going up for, for tenure. So, um, and for me, I, I think um, I just, I don't know, I wanna be in a place where I, it's a clear case. I mean, I, I, I suspect anyone would wanna be at that spot too, but uh, waiting to go up until you feel like it's a slam dunk and knowing when that's possible, I think that's where mentorship comes in. Can I add a follow-up question here for either of you? So I think someone had said in the chat and a couple of other people have brought up already that um, it's a more ambiguous process. You don't, you know, 
I think, and when we did our pre-tenure series, a lot of people said, I knew I needed this many pubs when I went up for tenure. So I mapped that out this many per year. And for the process here is a lot, you know, we don't have those same benchmarks written in black and white. In your, when you were, you're planning sort of your trajectory and when and what it might look like when you go up for full, what kind of questions should you ask to your mentors or senior colleagues and what kind of information should you be seeking before, as you, as you develop your own plan? So I, I'll start, Nate, but um, I do think, um, so, so your mentors change. Whatever mentors you had, uh, is that not that you don't keep the ones you have, but you probably need to mark, uh, broaden your mentor pool to make sure it includes people who are at the point where you want to be, right? They, who you want to be when you grow up, wherever they are. And they might not necessarily be in your university, right? A lot of times you can't find that person. Um, and when you're at full, because there aren't always a lot of fools where you are. So sometimes you might need to look outside of your department and look at, at even outside your college, sometimes even outside your university to find that person. But I, I can't say it enough that I do think you need to, to make sure you have that mentor pool. And then what I think we underestimate, but it still matters, the politics of your unit, your department, your college, they do matter to going to full just as much as they matter to go to getting tenure and moving to associate. And so make sure that you're asking questions within your unit about what matters to these people who will make this decision in your university. Um, that might mean find out what the provost thinks matters because that full, the provost is paying attention in a different way than they are at the associate level. What does the provost think? What does the dean think? Um, how active do you need to be in your university culture in the Senate in your university or as department chair? Is it expected that you have to be department chair before they will make you full? You know, stuff like that actually does happen a lot more than people will say. So I do think it, it behooves you to make sure you understand the office politics from moving up to full in your unit just as much as you did um, moving to associate and that stuff isn't written down. So you do need to continue going to coffee. You do need to continue going, taking people to lunch and trying to find out what's that unstated stuff that matters when they make that decision. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, knowing what, what, you know, what they're evaluating uh, at those upper levels beyond your department is, is really key. And you want mentors that, that have, that know that, have their, have their um, finger on the pulse of that, that process. Um, I think also asking and <clears throat> getting feedback on how you can um, uh, illustrate the impact you're having. Um, you know, you always hear about, you know, going up for full, they want to see evidence of national, international impact on the field. And so how to, how to measure that, how to illustrate that that's happening. And so getting feedback from people on, you know, does your CV and do your materials reflect that, that input or impact? Is it, you know, metrics around papers? Is it about participation on, um, on committees and panels and such on a national and international level? Uh, various ways that can be, that can happen, but uh, it all has to kind of come out in your materials. And that's, I think that's a tricky thing to, to navigate. Can I just do one quick follow up there? I think it's also important. I mean, it's really what 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 you're saying about the internal politics. hundred. I absolutely agree. But also, I would encourage people as you think you're getting closer to full to like float your CV, which means send it out to people outside of the university because you also have to have strong external letters of support that you have a national and sometimes an international presence in your field. And so sending those out your CV out to people outside of your university, I think is also an important thing. And maybe people that that aren't your best friend, right? <laughs> Who are gonna give you real feedback about what it looks like and, and sort of some, you know, advice on what to do or, you know, I think that that is another important thing to think about. At universities that are either like yours or aspirational to yours. Um, because what happens a lot when you move to full, people move. They don't necessarily stay at top tier universities because they don't have to. And it's a much better life for them for whatever reason to not be in that environment anymore. 
And so you don't necessarily, you want the advice that is comparable to the place you're trying to get full um, and or better or even more stringent than your institution. Make sure that's who you're asking. That's a great segue to Emily's next question. <laughs> Okay, so both Nicole and Nate and I have moved in during this sort of mid-career space. And so we wanted to talk about that. So what um, what makes you think consider a change of institution? And what might you think people need to think about if this is sort of something that is might be happening for them? Well, I can I can go first. Um, I, I think as anyone who experiences a move uh, will, will attest, it, it saps your momentum uh, for a period of time. Um, you have to, I mean, even I mean, just the logistics of moving, you know, and, and getting a partner settled and children and or children settled. Um, but then, you know, a new department having to reestablish connections with schools and leave some behind. Um, you know, you, you may have had courses that were on cruise control that you had been teaching for several years, and now you might be teaching new classes, so you have new preps coming in. So, so it just kills momentum for a period of time, and it may be, you know, a good year, even year and a half to two years, so you feel like you're kind of back up to speed in some cases, depending on the move. So, um, I think, I think it, it 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 takes a lot of consideration. I still would have moved, you know, I, and I I did um, I made a change just after getting tenure at my previous institution, just because the opportunity here was, was just fantastic. So um, I, I, would, I would do it over again in a heartbeat, but there's obviously some consequences you have to work through in a move. Um, yeah, I would agree with all of that. I think, so I, I moved um, into full. So I was an associate about to go up for full at my current institution and moved and negotiated full in my move. Um, I also considered moving when I got a, when I hit associate and was sitting in associate, I considered a move at that time too. Um, I think the, no, the typical considerations are things you probably would expect. Salary usually matters that in this business of higher ed, oftentimes you cannot get a raise unless you get a counteroffer. And so part of that is often a part of people's decision on thinking about moving. So if you decide to do that, um, you have to consider whether or not you will go. That's a, that is a, it is a part of the business of higher ed, but don't forget that higher ed is a business. So if you decide to pull that card, you do need to think about whether or not you're gonna go. Um, you also, of course, need to think about family. My decision was very much so wrapped up in family. I happen to have a dual, problem, a uh, dual problem, dual academic problem. My husband is an, is an a higher ed administrator. So we had to negotiate both of us in all of these potential moves that we were gonna make that can complicate things as well. So that was a part of it. You had to be at places that can handle both of you. Um, you have to, I, I do think you think about it in terms of your research, whether or not it is a pivot because you're gonna do something different or if you just wanna continue what you're doing. You want to think about um, whether or not this is a place that can hold what it is you're trying to do and where you're trying to make it go. I think Nate that comes through in what he said that um, this is a good place. This is a good place to do what he wants to do next, whatever that is. Is this a place that will has added value for you that can take you in the direction that you want to go for whatever it is you want to do and hold you? Because more than likely you're not going to move again for a couple of years, right? So you want to make sure it's a place that can hold you for a while and hold your family for a while. Um, you also, I think, want to think about whether or not, because you, that, that whole office politics part, so now you have to learn that again. You have to learn who the players are, what the expectations are, what matters, and it will be different than where you were. Um, and it will take time to figure that out and navigate all of that. Um, so those can actually be a part of the questions that you ask when you interview. I was very explicit in interviewing and asking, what is your expectation of me um, moving in this role in this way? Those sorts of things are important to ask because there'll be a new game to play. And so you'll want to make sure you're explicit about that um, as well. And new things to negotiate. That's the only thing. I'm, my mind always goes to what do you negotiate? So if you are yeah. making a move as associate professor or even associate to full, I, I did the same thing as Nicole. I, with my move, I was moved up to full. Um, it's a different negotiating game than it is in your, mm -hmm. your assistant professor. So please get advice from folks who have done this before. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. a different place to be. And it's important as a part of that, don't forget. So the advice that I got, someone gave me, and I always give it again, if I'm going to move, you basically have to give me a grant. That's how I thought about it. I got, I have a grant. I'm happy. I can do what I do where I am. So if you want me to move to wherever I'm going, you got to give me a grant. That's how I thought of whether or not that meant graduate students or materials or whatever it is. That's what my, that's what incentivized me to move um, and take my machine and Put it somewhere else. What you can't forget is that you are now associate. You are, you've done it. And so there, there's a good bet on the table that you can do it again. So you're, you're good for them just as much as they might be good for you. You are good for them. They are recruiting you. So they should be giving you what you need to be successful in this new place, including the delay it will take because it'll take time to set things up and it'll take time to set your family up and all these they should be paying for that. They should be compensating for that. So it is a whole different mindset. You have to remember that you are the commodity now. It is not about, please like me. It's about, well, if you, what do you got? What do you got if you want me? What do you got? Okay. What is the one piece of advice you wish you could give your past newly tenured self? Nate, you wanna go first, you wanna go? Go for it, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead, Nicole. I'm still thinking, um, I had a long um, time, yeah. <laughs> what, so I used to, um, pre-tenure, I used to carry around a one-pager. That was my research agenda. And now I carry around a one-pager that is my goals and values. I wish I would have done this sooner. I did it eventually. Um, I do it now uh, at least once a semester, usually, or at least once a year. And I really do keep it in a sheet protector. I walk around with it and don't lose it. Just the same way I used to lose, not lose my list of all the papers and where they were and which was in revise and resubmit, which was submitted and which was this and which was, I used to walk around with that so I can keep up with uh, my progression towards tenure. I now walk around with this values and goals doc um, because that mindset shift is hard sometimes to hold um, because, because we do all have the same job that we have and stuff keeps moving, it keeps rolling, it's just gonna keep happening. Um, but, it is important because I think Jeannie said it on her video, you will be given different opportunities and more opportunities, your world does get bigger. You do have to get, have a different way of thinking about what you say yes and no to and making sure that you keep that aligned to, to why you decided you're here, why you do the job you do in the way that you do it. Um, and so I wish I would have done that sooner, um, but I do do it now. And the, uh, the other advice I would give if, if is it might not hurt and it doesn't hurt to think about getting a professional coach. That's one thing that I did that someone told me later on that I wish I would have done sooner. Um, and it was helpful to have a professional coach, someone outside of us and outside of academia sees the world differently, helping you navigate that space. That would be the other advice I would give. Yeah, I guess, um... You know, aside from just always the, you know, self-critique, oh, I should have worked harder, should have collaborated more. <laughs> um, I, I think, I don't know, I, I have some, I, I give my past self advice on pre-tenure about some things that I, you know, took on or things that were asked of me in my pre-tenure position that I feel like I should have pushed back on a little bit more that, that spent, that I spent a great deal of time doing for no payoff really whatsoever. Um, so I, I think, I, 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 I don't know, I think uh, perhaps, you know, looking back now, advice in terms of um, just stronger collaborations perhaps and trying to build and foster long-term collaborations, I think um, is probably the, the advice I, I'd give myself um, <laughs> at this point. Jessica, we have, um, sorry, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I was gonna just ask, could you say more about your values and goals sheet? Like what, 
do you write on there? And then how do you map that onto? Can I, can I just, you? can I share that? Like maybe through two months ago, Nicole and I were texting about something and I was like trying to figure something out. She's like, where's your values and goals? And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about lady? <laughs> I don't have a values and goals sheet. So she sends me a picture. Well, same thing I'll tell you. <laughs> um, in fact, I think I texted it to you and I'm not kidding. I have it like, um, it's in my phone on my favorites picture. Like I, I keep it. Uh, it is a, it is like a North star for me. So um, I, and I should say, I'd be happy to share it. Um, if you want Jessica or Emily, you can share it with this group. I'd be happy to share it or email me and I'll share it to you. Um, so what it is for me, um, it was, it is a matter of really just sitting down clearing the headspace, not necessarily thinking specifically about work, but just me as an individual, what are the things that I value, right? And you got to keep it short because yes, we value everything. So I can value 20 things, but what do I really value? And I'm going to keep it to five things, no more than five things, which I do. Um, and then for those things for which I value, it's like, uh, you guys will appreciate this, but it's like AP goals and objectives. It's just literally, what are the things that I'm doing that allow me to achieve success in that value? So my values right now, I will say, I they look different than they did when I was first an associate. I had a, a different set of values, different things I was striving. I shouldn't say that. I, have a, I had a different set of... Um, I had a different set of activities that I was doing to achieve those values. I think what most people find is your values are pretty set. They are what they are. One of my values is uh, my family is intact, stable, and thriving. That's always been a value of mine. But I'm able to say that better than I was able to say it five years ago. What I used to just say is my family is happy <laughs> because that, that was my value. I want my family to be happy. Um, but now I'm a little bit better able to talk about what I mean by happy and for me happy means intact and stable and thriving um and I that was the way I say that now when I moved so when I moved to Florida State I revised this list and I've been here two years and I have revised it again based on what I'm doing now um for me family intact and and, and stable and thriving means these are my five things I'm working on here my marriage is stable and intact because Quite frankly, we know a lot of people whose marriages cannot survive this academic life that we have, especially when you move into full and you start having to do more, being expected to do more. The way that you do that work um, can really bother your home life. And so you have to re really figure out how to manage that again. And so I pay attention to that. Um, my kids, I moved children and that mattered and made a difference to, to how they were doing. I moved a, a pre-K, a middle school and a high schooler. So it mattered. So I need to think about that. Um, my siblings and my family, my mom and dad, and how much I engage with them. It's real easy for me not to call people because I spend all day on Zoom and on the phone. So I'm being intentional about that. Um, same goes with my friends and then for myself. The older you get, the harder it is to maintain these bodies that we have. So I used to just be able to eat salad and I was healthy. Now I actually have to exercise, <laughs> but I actually have to put it on there. And I put it on there and I put it on my calendar. And it, it becomes a part. So when I have to make decisions about whether I sit on this webinar today or go do something else, I have to look at this piece of paper and make sure that whatever I say I'm doing lines up with this. And if it doesn't, it's a little easier to say no to it. So that's what's on my list. And I'm, I'm happy to share it. Thank you. I think we have a question that Jess and I wanted to go back to related to moving. And you just talked a little bit about that, Nicole. So the question was, is for, at the associate level, um, were folks approached or was it something you applied for? And how might that change when you're at the associate or full level when considering a move? And when do you know it's time to move somewhere else? I think that's a really good question. And it, that, that's really individual, I think. But I don't know if you have any more comments on that, Nicole or Nate. Yeah, I was I was approaching that was definitely a, a major factor in in moving, especially because um, I was in current position, I was approached from a slightly different field. So my degrees in school psychology, I was in a school school psychology uh, program. And um, but I always um, my work crossed over significantly in, into special education. And I don't know, I felt always felt more at home in that field anyway. So 
um, and and also I also had sort of um, dream positions like where I would <laughs> where I would move to, and uh, I was just fortunate to be approached by one of those. So those are all just factors that went into the decision that you know felt like a no brainer. Um, so for me, I was um, in in every situation I have been approached. Um, I didn't go look for it. I was approached for it. Um, you should know when you get associate, people start looking for you. So you will be, if you've been successful and you've got intent and you've gotten tenure and you're so active in your field, people are now looking, whether you know it or not, they are. Um, and, and they're looking to find out if you're a person who's movable. And as a person who's a full professor who's led searches before, I'm telling you right now, even some of you on this call, I have looked. <laughs> so we do know who you are. We do look for you. So people will start to approach you once you hit tenure um, to see if you're a person who can move and can contribute to whatever it is that they're looking at. I knew it was time for me to move when um, it, was, it was a dual decision. Part of it was... Um, I felt like I was continuously saying no to things I wanted to be able to do. And I felt like the institution I was at wasn't allowing me to say yes. I felt there's a, there's a point of this where you yourself decide to say yes or no to opportunities, but I felt like I was being forced to say no because the university just didn't have what I needed to do what I wanted to do. That's when I, and my shoes felt too small. That's when I knew it was time for me to move. The other reason was a financial decision. That that whole thing about making sure that you get a raise at your institution or being willing to move is not a small factor. Academia, you all know this, there's huge disparities in salary ranges in academia, and they look very different depending on what group you belong to and what discipline you belong to. Um, and if you feel that you are not getting the pay that you should be getting for the quality of work that you are doing, you are within your rights to start looking elsewhere because you are the commodity. You And especially as you move to coal, we all just talked about how much more service you do, how much more you contribute to the machine that is the university that you're at. Are you being compensated appropriately for that? And if you are not, you are well within your rights to find it elsewhere. And that is how this game is played. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I mean, I'll just say for me personally, I had always said, and I had actually made it pretty clear to people around me that I would leave for the right job. And I fully recognize that not everyone has the ability to say that because there are partners. I also moved three kids across the country, three elementary age children across the country. Um, and that was a big thing, but I had made it sort of known that if the right thing came along, I would leave for it. <laughs> so, and I think that if once you're associated, you can say those things and then people may come to you and if it's the right thing, it's the right thing. So I think you should feel like, you know, it's okay to make statements like that and let the people around you know that. So we're going to skip our last video. We'll probably come back to it in a later webinar and we have folks talking about it in a later, it was the work life balance video. So everybody's like, please tell me the secret. Um, the summary of everyone's answers was that we're all really working hard to achieve it. Um, so we wanted to end just with kind of a summary of the take home messages from what some of our DR members shared in their videos and the panel today, and then leave a couple of minutes for final questions. So I, I know that those of you who know me know that I am also newly post tenure. So as I hosted this with Emily, I was like, I don't know if I, I'm just asking the questions here because I want to know the answers too. So these are things that really stood out in terms of take home messages of looking at that pipe, the next pipeline. One is not, don't lose momentum. So keep going, find, find that momentum and what is valuable to you, what your goals are, reassessing what you're doing. Um, look ahead and plan accordingly. So review promotion requirements at your institution, talk to mentors and senior colleagues. Um, in our third webinar, we are going to talk about this in a lot more detail. So we'll have people actually go through the ins and outs of um, promotion requirements and the process. Um, revisit your research agenda, explore new avenues or extensions to your work. I probably should add here to new potential collaborations. Revisit your teaching portfolio take on leadership positions or be strategic about the service you take on where you'll have opportunities for leadership. 
um, align your work with your goals and values, um, create or think about sort of what your personal brand is. Do you have one already? What do you want it to be? What do you want people to think of when they think of you um, as an academic and a scholar? And then support others in junior folks at your institution and others who are, are working towards this as well. So we'll use our last couple of minutes um, for folks to ask questions. You're welcome to unmute and ask a question if you have, um, or you can put it in the chat if you prefer. I guess we answered everything about getting promoted to full. <laughs> No, there should be questions. If there's not quite the other thing we're gonna, I think we should mention Jess is that there are every time we have these, we're gonna have people other than just me and Jessica here to answer questions. So we'll have special guests for each one. Oh, I'm giving no advice. At all. <laughs> I'm literally just facilitating the the logistics. <laughs> um, and the other thing, I think, if there's stuff that's really, um, if you if there's something that you really want to know about on the next two, if you send that. To us, we can we can put those questions out toward the to the people that are coming. Um, we'll have to give them new questions, but we're happy to so, sort of forward those questions to the guests that are coming in the next two. Yeah, so that kind of leads us to let you know what's coming next. So if you join us next Friday, and if you're not able to join live, these will all be recorded on the the CCDR YouTube channel. Um, but next Friday, we're going to focus on the research agenda. So we have Chris Espin, Mike Coyne, and Kathleen Lane are going to join us. Um, and they're going to talk about kind of things we started getting into today, sort of momentum with your research agenda, um, shifting, expanding your, your research or narrowing your research, um, and expectations with that you have for yourself and that your institutions may have for you as well. So hopefully we will see you there. And if you want to stay on and ask more questions, feel free. <laughs> but thank you for joining us for this, this first webinar. And thank you to Cole and Nate for coming.